Hello and welcome to the Happy Farm D podcast. I am your host, founder of the company and coach, Alex Barker. In this episode, we'll be talking about advocacy, kind of both from a bigger picture perspective, talking specifically about a pretty spicy thing that uh, the American Medical Association released. We'll be talking about that and advocacy and how that plays a role into it but also with a professional who is a actual patient advocate. We're joined today by Andrea Leschak. I love saying her last name. <laughs> she told me it's Polish. Uh, it's very fun to say. And Andrea shares a little bit of her story, how she got into it, how she used, I would say, something that is very painful, someone going through something very painful in the healthcare system and how she used that as motivation to really drive her career in a very different direction. And now describing a little bit of what she does and how she works with patients, advocating for them, both as a pharmacist, but just as a healthcare professional. And so with that, let's go to the interview. Hey, Andrea, how are you? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm ready to talk about spicy um uh american medical association um um statements about pharmacists and and how we're not medical providers oh yes yes <laughs> <sighs> so i wanted to talk to you today about uh kind of starting off with what the ama said mm -hmm. and then diving into an area of your expertise um mm -hmm. which is advocacy and talking about the profession and perhaps helping us all think a little bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. But for context, we'll, we'll talk about the AMA statement. Mm -hmm. um, but for our listeners who may have not ever met you yet, uh, who who is Andrea and what do you do? So, <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, I'm a board certified pharmacist originally in geriatrics. However, for the past few years, I pivoted and expanded over into patient advocacy. And so I work one on one with clients broadly in healthcare navigation and decision support and um, pretty much being of service to whatever their needs are to get them the best outcomes, whether it be pharmacy related or not. You know, once you figure that out, that's got to feel like a really fulfilling kind of work. I was going to use the word fight, but that may not be the right word to describe what a pharmacist does. Yeah. But sometimes advocacy is fighting. I mean, my wife has had um, her share of medical troubles and mm -hmm. every time we advocate for ourselves or um, seemingly argue with professional uh, medical people, mm -hmm. it, it seems like I'm having to fight. You know, it feels yeah. adversarial to to fight for the betterment of my wife, which I don't like. I'm not a fan of that. You know, um, I'm glad you actually brought that up because it is interesting within the advocacy space. And, and I don't actually have the definition pulled up of what an advocate is. People have very specific ideas when they hear the word advocate. Some immediately think of an attorney. Um, mm -hmm. because they're used to seeing advocacy in, in the legal space. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I'll call myself a patient advocate or a healthcare advocate, um, I will also be a guide. I'll be a mentor. I'll be a battle buddy to pick up on what you're saying in terms of the fight. Um, mm -hmm. As an advocate, I seek win-win. And I want the patient provider experience across the board to be elevated because I know our healthcare providers are, are stressed and overwhelmed. And I know the chaos that the patient is living in. So nobody in that encounter for that seven to nine minutes that most of them have together is feeling at their best self. And so if we can find a way to find win-win, a common goal, a common something to where everybody can see each other as a person wanting the best for them, the patient want the best for the, the provider and vice versa, then all of a sudden the conversations change. And there have been times where I do feel that I am in the arena and I have absolutely no problem putting some armor on, okay. hopping down in there and getting into the dust. 
Uh, but that's not my default. When I come into one of those encounters where everybody's got their arms crossed and every no one feels like they've been heard, you know, or is listening, um, I've been in situations where at the end of it, the provider and the patient are hugging each other. I mean, that finding that one common something, thread, awareness, experience, and then all of a sudden the whole mood changes. And um, that's why for me, when you're saying it must be amazing to feel, I mean, I'm going into my, what, 31st year <laughs> as a pharmacist or something like that. I'm starting to want to forget it, quite frankly, um, <laughs> getting to be so many that, I mean, for years, it felt like putting on blue jeans that were just way too tight. And, <laughs> and now it's like <sighs> everything that I've been doing for 30 plus years from all facets of my life is woven into my advocacy. Hmm. It's a beautiful work and it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is a great transition to the AMA article because the, that the, the recent statement made, I believe in February of 2024, um, highlights a problem that is fighting against advocacy, uh, at least for our profession or mm -hmm. our point of view. Um, and it feels very adversarial. Mm -hmm. um, so for context for anyone's listening, and, and if you don't mind, Andrea, I'll just give some brief Go synopsis and uh, you can fill in the blanks for what I maybe overtly missed. But mm -hmm. essentially, the AMA is at it again, and they've come up with another statement trying to define what's the difference between doctors and pharmacists and pharmacists are trying to pretend to be doctors and we don't have enough education as medical providers and we don't provide medical care according mm -hmm. to the AMA. And because of the lack of training, we are inadequately prepared to uh, diagnose people with diseases and thus should not be allowed to uh, prescribe or dispense medicines of our own accord based upon, <clears throat> here's where my bias comes in, uh, using the same tests that they would use in a clinic. Um, mm -hmm. it, th besides that final statement I made, is that a fairly accurate, somewhat fair statement of what the AMA made? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean... Um trying to, as I said, seek win-win, mm. I can... A good advocate thing to say. <laughs> I can read that statement and I can think of an experience I had with a client where they actually had an engagement. When I say they had an engagement, meaning I found the notes from the pharmacist who probably did the MTM. Mm. So I could read the information. And so I understood the recommendations that that provider, that that pharmacist made. However, I, because I have the advocate relationship with my client, knew what their goals were. In that particular moment, the pharmacist did not have context. And so if I think of that, the recommendations weren't wrong, but contextually they were somewhat limited. Where it, so then if I think about that within the AMA statement, I can see where a, a, a one approach could be, well, pharmacists don't have this kind of relationship. They don't know the full, under, they don't have the context. Then how could they pick up those nuances? Um, but that's a system issue. <laughs> it's not a lack of pharmacist you know, knowledge and expertise. We're inherently not woven into the system. Uh, that, I'm glad you pointed it out because I was about to say, like, that's very much like an advocate to point this out. <laughs> And, and you're, I think you're right. Like, uh, we, as pharmacists, we don't want to be doctors. We don't want to be diagnosing uh, no. cancer. We don't want to be mending bones. We, we don't want to do that kind of work. It's not what we signed up for. And it's not what most pharmacists want to do anyways. Um, if I remember correctly, what spawned this response from the AMA was a bill, uh, that was trying to be passed for prescribing rights for pharmacists to um, uh, prescribe Paxlovid. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, 
probably. Yeah. So, so treating, you know, COVID, right? Right. Um, who knows if it actually works? <laughs> but anyways, another subject <laughs> for another day. But it it's just, um, you know, I think it's the AMA wanting to hold on to power um, mm -hmm. and, and wanting to not divvy out that power. Right. Even though the system is crying out in the pains of the power that they they hold, exactly right? it's not working, and work well, I should say. And I apologize, but the piggyback, the counterside of what I said, trying to view it from an AMA physician perspective, if I look at it myopically, which I think is what they're doing, quite mm. frankly. If I then look at it from the other side of what I know what pharmacists are capable of and the knowledge and the expertise in a, in a robust system is we are amazing problem solvers. And because we have that, that phrase medication expert attached to us, we are amazing forecasters and predictors of downstream ramifications. And we are not in that room to have those conversations in the moment when the care, the therapy is being implemented. And so the ability to go time out, <laughs> you know, I'm having conversations, you know, as a pharmacist with my clients now as an advocate, I don't offer clinical advice. I work with healthcare navigation and decision support, but I'm bringing the tools of a pharmacist into those conversations. So we've already explored what the evidence is, what they want, so that when we go into the appointment, the doctor now has a better understanding of full, you know, it's more transparent. The, the client is heard, the doctor has a chance, and then shared decision-making actually happens because now the patient is armed with information in a way that they understand it to have a better conversation. Otherwise, what ends up happening is we have very much a top-down flow of information. And I mm -hmm. see it all the time in the way that the the guidelines are structured. I mean, let's be real. I mean, <laughs> I went in and I'll use my own self as an example. I went in, I'm, I'm over 50, 55 years old. I celebrated. I'm wise sage age now. I am not having babies at this stage of the game. And yet I went into an appointment, they swapped my doctor and they gave me a midwife. Now that's fine, I guess, philosophically. But if I'm asking about menopause and they give me a midwife, I mean, what is this per, <laughs> what, I mean, I'm not saying she wasn't skilled, but she pulled up out of the medical literature, an algorithm or a flow sheet or a diagram or guideline, whatever you want to say. It was basically like, well, these are the hormones. <laughs> so, mm. you know, I mean, I'm not saying they're not skilled. But to plant your flag is that only the physician has that knowledge. Well, yeah, I don't want to diagnose. I'm not out there trying to figure that out. But what I do want are more robust conversations to where people can actually understand what's going on, have a more holistic, predictive forecasting conversation about when something should work, when if it's not, we get to pull back, you know, and, and be included in that, um, that piece. Yeah, I can get a little soapboxy. <laughs> so you're passionate about it. And I think that's what keeps you grounded. Mm -hmm. um, what your statement kind of made me think about was the siloed nature of our healthcare system and mm -hmm. how it's causing problems and how I feel like this statement comes across from the AMA that to make claims like we don't provide medical care as pharmacists. I mean, that, that it's so out of left field. It, it feels like someone didn't actually talk to a, a doctor. Um, because I, I don't know many doctors that would ever make that statement. Um, I agree. I mean, I don't have many doctor friends and they tease me and our profession for being pill pushers. But like at the end of the day, I think they have an understanding that, you know, we understand diseases. <laughs> we, we make recommendations. We help people with the basic of things that sometimes they don't even consider themselves. So, um, 
when I think about this statement, I think, man, this is this is a uh, a symptom of the real problem, which is not having those conversations. I think that you're you're wanting or or talking about anyway. Right. Uh, it's very turf based, and mm. it has lost sight of the whole reason I perceive that any of us signed up for this. I mean, I don't think most of us signed yeah. up for glory. I don't think, yeah, I mean, maybe when I was 19 years old and my parents were questioning me of how many marine biologists that study sharks are there in the world in 1980 something? And could yeah. you be one of the top 10? You know, they're like, so if you go to this school, you'll get a paycheck. And in this one, maybe not, you know, you, you were looking for some kind of job security type thing. But, um, you know, we signed up to do some good, to help people, to, you know, remove chaos and pain and, sorry, I get a little, um, because both my parents, my mom died of inflammatory breast cancer, a, you know, a, a cruel disease very early. Mm -hmm. um, my dad had dementia. I've mm -hmm. seen it from the caregiver side of the patients just grasping for information and wanting to be heard and wanting somebody to be acknowledged. And I know it as a daughter walking up to a nurse's counter with a checkbook, basically with a pen over the check saying, tell me how much money it takes to fix this. Because I don't want that to be why my dad doesn't get care. How does he fall five times in three days when you guys signed up to care for him? You knew what was going on. And now he's got stitches, he's got a fractured neck. I mean, well, the fractured neck led to the, the center, but I'm like, if it's money, tell me what you need, because I want that off the table, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think we signed up for this. We all did. You, that's what we whatever label we want, whatever set of initials we have after our name. And yet, because the system is structured in the way it is, whether it be pay models and things we won't figure out today. And quite frankly, why I went and became an advocate, because at 55, I don't feel like I've got the time to deal with this crap anymore. We've been having this argument about provider status and do we provide care and all this. Sorry, I can get a little, <laughs> again, I can <laughs> start to, to drop some uh, sailor language in there. We've been arguing about this since 1993 or before. My dad was yeah. a pharmacist. They were discussing this in 1970 something when he graduated. I don't have time to deal with it. People need help. There's a way that I can serve. And I, 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 I took a different way. Mm. You know, the analogy that I've been using lately to describe, I mean, not just pharmacy, but uh, physicians, uh, DOs, MDs, is is it, it feels to me like feudal uh, medieval times. <laughs> um, and knights are, or uh, doctors are kind of like knights or lords, mm -hmm. and they... They rule the land, they're purveyor of the land, they're the leader, and they are trained to be the leader, and they're the competent leader. Mm -hmm. And they hold all this power, and to imagine giving away any of it is just totally out of the question. Mm -hmm. um, and so they'll use their power, their lawyers, their money uh, to kind of shut down any kind of opportunist from from cropping up and taking away that power and um the system that is has run its course mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not some doomsdayist about the healthcare system or about the american system or even the world um but i do believe that the healthcare system is overdue for a significant overhaul Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's coming. Um, and I don't know what the trigger will be, or I don't have any crystal ball here, but I, I think that things are going to change. Um, and advocacy, I feel like is a part of it because what's at the heart right now of the media and our culture is advocacy. Right. Um, it's such a crucial part. I mean, you watch almost any news program and it's advocating for something. 
right. does you know does it doesn't matter what side you're on uh mm -hmm. it's it's gun rights and freedom of speech or it's it's fighting for uh the destitute um and 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 minorities and, mm -hmm. and, and immigrant rights and w whatever side you're on right. it's about that message right so i see it as a focal point for healthcare transformation right in your work in advocacy i'm curious to know about how you think about the future not just of advocacy but of the things that you see the healthcare system needing to change in order to be operating in you know the the 21st century right it's such a multifaceted complex layered nuanced piece and like right. you said i mean i too yeah. i'm not doomsday i'm not expecting you to say perfect but, things <laughs> right um <laughs> So and I love your legal example. I often talk to my clients about them being, I use ship, I'll, I'll use the example of a ship. And so they'll say, I'll say, um, you know, we the doctor is the captain of the ship, right? But over the doctor, over the captain of a ship is an admiral. And I perceive that my clients are the admiral. And they're like, well, we don't have any power. And I'm like, absolutely. Abs actually, you have ultimate power. Because 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 you choose to listen to the doctor or not, and so if the captain isn't doing what you like as the admiral, you're making decisions, right? And so I think that they have supreme power. Um, and so I love your feudal example because I think that that's also um, <laughs> I, I I align with that as well. And yet a good a good leader, whether they be in the feudal system or the captain of a ship listens to frontline people. You mm -hmm. know, if somebody sees a ship in front of another ship, it doesn't matter what their rank is. If they think they're on a collision path, a good captain will listen to that person, rank or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wish that that was more of what was going on. But to your point, um, if you, I read the uh, pharmacist code, uh, oath code, I read the pharmacist oath not long ago and advocacy, I believe is used once if not twice in it now. So the, and I don't know if it's always been, I know that the pharmacist oath gets revamped um, from time to time, but advocacy is within the phrase one. So I think that being an advocate is woven into the fabric of all pharmacists. And yet I don't believe that all pharmacists are practicing patient advocacy because patient advocacy is its own standalone field mm. or discipline or career path. Um, and within that, a patient advocate could be my neighbor who is caring for his wife that has dementia because he has acute awareness and intimate knowledge of what it's like to be a spouse of somebody with dementia, or it could be a physician who has flipped again more into that patient first patient provider experience relationship. And so I think what's happening is, is we're seeing burnout from providers across spe the spectrum. We are losing providers um, because they just can't take the pace anymore. Many of them are thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to go private and not take insurance anymore. And I'm going to be concierge and that's going to be the solution, um, which brings its own problem, uh, whether it be for them as a business model or lack of access <laughs> to the rest of us that can't afford the concierge uh, or executive you know, uh, care model. I mean, right now, I think I called one of the executive medical systems around here. Well, they offer an executive path. And I want to say it was a one year wait list, a one year lit wait to just get onto the wait list <laughs> before you could even be considered <laughs> for the executive path. And yeah. so my perception as an advocate is that if we don't start from the patient side and the provider side, acknowledging this larger per position, we're all negatively impacted because the providers need care too. And who are they going to go see if the system is so broken? Where are they going to find someone who wants to take care of them or their family, right? And so um, I think that this subtle movement, and, I, and it's not so subtle anymore, it's becoming more and more present, more and more people know about 
patient advocacy or the patient provider experience or the patient experience as a broader term in systems, I think that this is growing and the need for this awareness is growing. Um, I just don't know if it's how quickly it's going to show up. Yeah, I think with the, the healthcare system, because it's such a behemoth, um, mm -hmm. something bad has to happen in order for change to happen. Right. Yeah. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I often think of the act and I can never remember her name, but I think it was Emily. The Emily Act? Does that not, sound familiar? Not sure. About uh, that. We'll fact check this later, and we'll put an asterisk somewhere. But it's it's the um, it's the horrible uh, child's death because of the contamination. I think with IVs. Oh, I was thinking of the one where the nurse uh, gave the wrong medication. I think it was a nurse that gave a wrong medication. I used to use that video as an example. It wasn't mm. Emily though. It was a different, but this is the sad thing, right? There's so many of them, but we can't remember the name per se, but it was a, uh, somebody That's grabbed awesome. the wrong drug. The parent was in the room, saw the child basically code. And, um, mm. she, you know, was gone in days. Um, oh, and, awesome. uh, yeah, but I'm not, so I'm not sure about the one you're talking about. Um, well, regardless, it it my my point is that the system moves so slowly that it it takes a shocking thing and the public's attention on the shocking thing yep. to demand legislation to force a shift of the system in order to move because otherwise it's just not going to happen. Yep. And uh, the system was built up in such a way where um, if, if you think about, you know, uh, baby boomers and, and to a lesser extent, Gen X and millennials, um, the system allowed for people to just follow the system and trust it, right? So when I think about my mother, who I won't d ever date, um, <laughs> on a podcast in a public forum, um, she just trusts her doctor. She mm -hmm. just, you know, doctor said this, and that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And 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 when you talk to a millennial or a Gen Z or this next generation, um, I don't know what the official name is now, but you know, they're much more distrusting. They they do yep. not take it at at their word they want to see what the internet says they want to read what else is out there and what are my options do i need a medicine can i do mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. which is why misinformation is so important such an important topic in today's age mm -hmm. and so when i think about advocacy it the generational shift i think will force this in the next five to ten years to come to light because people are just not going to stand for it anymore right. um after this podcast, I got I, I got stories to tell you <laughs> about what I've experienced. And mm -hmm. um, so what I'm curious to learn about is your stance on pharmacy advocacy, because when I read Michael Hoag's, um president of APHA, current president of APHA as 2024, his his response to it. It made me feel for the first time ever, uh, and, and what's, I, I can't, I don't have the emotional words to describe how I felt, I guess, but it, it felt to me like, wow, someone publicly standing up against this message, you know, there's, there's no lawsuit being drawn it there's no um ignoring it or or coming up with a statement to not sound adversarial in response to the AMA and um i i felt i walked away from it a little bit inspired even perhaps mm -hmm. the right emotional word and you, you highlighted that we we brand ourselves as medication experts you know and it feels limiting to to be calling ourselves that. What right. do you hope we can do as pharmacists to advocate for ourselves? 
So, so for me, pharmacists synonymous with medication experts, it's not a period, it's an and. And that's where that, because of what we know, we have the ability to predict and forecast in impact downstream, you mm. know, to understand once we take a certain path, most often this is what happens, right? And so the conversation, depending on if we're looking at advocating for pharmacists as pharmacists in a profession or to remind pharmacists that in that moment, is it possible would you meet with your patient, even if it is the most fleeting <laughs> of moments, is there a way to, to connect at a different level to ask a question, to re-engage? And I realize the chaos that that might feel like, but is there a way to find 42 seconds <laughs> and just find something to where you can gain clarity and insight and context for what your person is going through. Mm. And then weave in some of that prediction, that forecast, as opposed to just literally reinforcing the information that you're handing on a leaflet or that's coming off a computer screen or answer questions in a different way or ask questions in a different way um, to create more of that. I'm with you. I'm in this together. And maybe right now, if I've got 15 cars in the drive through and a two hour wait and the phone systems just crashed because that never happens. Right. Um, you know, maybe right now isn't the time, but if you call me back, this is when I'm available or, you know, we'll, if we can find some way, I think that for pharmacists, well, it sounds like you're taking on more work. And there might be an argument that you're not being paid for it, you know, because that's another thing. Well, I'm doing more, but I'm still not getting paid for my value. Um, I have found that there is a thing that it's like you said, that inspired. You just feel better about what you're doing. It changes the encounter to where you feel part of the experience. Mm. And I can tell you that a lot of the people that we're caring for, are in really crappy situations and they have very complex, emotionally charged e experiences. And if we can find just a nanosecond to bring some peace into their life, how much better would we feel about what we were doing, even in the existing dysfunctional care model? Um, so that's kind of what I look at with as a pharmacist, when I talk to other pharmacists that are looking at advocacy, um, you know, whether it, to expand what they're currently doing or because they just, you know, can't continue to do what they do anymore. I mean, I never thought that I was going to leave pharmacy, traditional pharmacy. Um, mine was because I moved. It was just like the most bizarre set of circumstances. We knew we were moving. I had resigned my faculty position. My sister and I were at the beach three days after I left my faculty position and we get a phone call from the emergency department. My dad's hallucinating. He drove himself to the hospital. And by the time I got home, despite the hospital telling me they were going to keep him overnight and monitor him because he had been there before we knew what was going on. They sent him off to a psych unit, a lock psych unit would not tell me where he was. Thank God I had power of attorney was able to get him out, but they had handcuffed him and sent him overnight, an elderly gentleman who didn't, you know, wouldn't have killed a fly, you know, um, who went to the hospital seeking help. And uh, in that moment, I told my husband, I can't go back to work right now because if this is what's going on, I need to be here. Can we fix our life so that it's okay if I take some space? And that space went from three months to nine months. And, and then as I sat there and watched now as a daughter going through it after having already done it for 12 years or so as a clinician in SNF long-term care faculty and geriatrics and whatnot, I was like, this is jacked up. <laughs> I, and I was in a position at this stage of my life now to do it on my own and try a different mm. way. 
Um, so it wasn't like I wanted to wash my hands per se of being a pharmacist, but I no longer wanted to be handcuffed, <laughs> you know, metaphorically to the system in the way that it was structured. I think it's wonderful that you were able to take something really painful from your history and turn it into not just a passion, but like a way of being mm -hmm. uh, your, your work. Um, my uh, father passed away from terminal brain cancer and mm. uh, near the end, you know, I can relate to the chaos that is someone losing their mind. Mm -hmm. and you know contemplating maybe we should handcuff him you know so that like he doesn't run away um yeah. and it's uh it's so sad and painful um so i'm i'm sorry that you had to go through that to watch probably a man that you really admire um deteriorate in that way well, he was my parent. I love my mom. And my mom gave me my sense of adventure and, you know, that whole thing of, oh, I'm 50. I'm going to go start a company, <laughs> you know, because my mom was just never would have thought she couldn't do something. You know, she was just full of life. But my dad was my person. And um, mm. to watch that, it was horrific. And, you yeah. know, they talk in the Sto in Stoic philosophy, I believe it is, they talk about the obstacles, your path. Um, and I also happened to go to a, a Buddhist temple, um, and, you know, within Buddhism, you know, like, you know, pain and suffering, how can we find the equanimity in it? Yeah. And so for me, you know, it's about knowing what I know now, when somebody calls me, how can I use what I went through? Oh, by the way, with everything else that I've done over these years, to try to bring some peace mm -hmm. and to allow someone to offload that heavy lifting, that burden, the chaos, so that they can find that moment in the storm where they're not being whipped around like a flag on a flagpole frantic. And that in all that, they can sit and be present with people that they love or, you know, present with themselves before the time is gone because if it's not me, they're running around kind of in the background, they're fragmented. They want to be with the loved one or they're trying to take care of themselves, but their healing energy. There's that is being focused on, Oh, I've got to go fight with the insurance. I've got to fight with the doctor, the fight that you were talking about. Yeah. Because that's what they're also going through. Mm-hmm. I remember it well. <laughs> it it sucks. And it changes us. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. I remember my wife going through some things for the first time uh, during our marriage. And it really shifted how I saw this entire healthcare system. Because mm -hmm. um, I think it's easy to detach what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, like the job tasks and the responsibilities, you do those things and they are what they are. But as soon as you experience it for what it is and you emotionally, spiritually, mentally go through the rigmarole that is healthcare, uh, it, it hits you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you get frustrated or angry or defeated or you know just want to throw your hands up right, right? and get that checkbook out <laughs> how yeah. much is it going to cost <laughs> um and it is the system that we have wrought um mm -hmm. it in in all of its beauty and ugliness it has saved lives yep um but it's also led to the destruction of of many and it sounds like you, uh, I, I love that you're both a fan of Stoics and, and Buddhism. I mean, that's probably like the perfect philosophy for any advocate. Um, 
what a beautiful story to tell um because you've you've connected with something really deep and spiritual about like who you are and you you've used your background to live it out for people congratulations well well thank you um i'm still learning i can tell you that there i think with as a healthcare provider we inherently want to fix things <laughs> And there are times where things are not, everything may be figure outable, but it may not be fixable in the mm. way that we want it to be. And so that for me in the transition has been one of the more challenging aspects of advocacy. Mm. Because as a provider, I could look at a situation and kind of see that downstream ramification. And yet, if it's what someone wants to do, I'm, I'm there to serve them, to help them. Yeah. And so how do you navigate that emotionally, intellectually? How do you realize that if they want to say, I'm good, this is over, that that's what you then figure out how to support. Mm. Or if they want to keep going forward, even if you're looking at it going, you know, I just don't see it. Sometimes you have to go, okay, well, how can I look at this completely different? Because mm. this is what they want. And so um, there's definitely a learning curve to it. I think the work that you're describing there, you know, the messy middle, as it were, mm -hmm. um, but also the values that you've talked about previously is probably very interesting to pharmacists um, because it, it sounds like a very active role that you, you take mm -hmm. uh, for patients. Um, do you get a lot of pharmacists asking you what in the world do you do? I do. Um, I've had a few uh, pharmacists that I've coached. I, I work with, some pharmacists that come to me, I also have pharmacists who will tell me they want to do advocacy, but they don't want to do it like I do it mm. because they couldn't be in the storm. Mm. And I find that fascinating because if you were to have met me at any point in my career, I am not inherently the person I would, I would not think that I'm the person that would run out into the crowd to, you know, to engage. However, I have been told that I am that person. But in my mind, I was kind of content behind the counter or in the room without having that direct emotional connection. Um, so when I decided to do that, my sister looked at me and she, you know, she questioned, <laughs> she was like, are you nuts? You know, you've seen what this is like when we were in it with mom and dad. She's like, why would you ever sign up for this? And my response is, well, it's in those moments, like you said, in that mess, that the true opportunities are, are present, right? Because we can have these bigger conversations, these relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know my people, my clients, I know them. Um, one night I got a text from one and uh, I was taking a walk and I'm, I, there, I go back and look at my phone and there's a series of texts and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Because there's parameters. This is how we work together, depending on their needs. Um, and basically it said, she doesn't want to go to the emergency department until she knows you'll come. And I was like, mm. wait a second, <laughs> you know, getting on the phone going, I'm, I'm not 911. You know, we've, <laughs> what is going on? Um, and so she ended up going, but I met her at the hospital. So I was there from nine, from eight o'clock at night till one o'clock in the morning. Oh, um, man. and I went back, uh, the, the, not the next day, but the day after, um, because she had somebody to fill in and by being in the room and seeing it, you know, it was a whole different response to being able mm. to advocate for appropriate care. I mean, I watched her receive a medication and immediately start to have a reaction and I don't know if it was supposed to be some kind of telepathic communication because she wasn't hooked up to any telemetry and, you know, I'm watching her and I'm like, well, surely the nurse is coming back. And 
<laughs> nobody's coming in and I'm so I'm like walking the halls until I can find someone. I was like, I need eyes on her. This is not baseline. This is not right. I don't know what she would have done had I not been in the room in that moment. Um, it's not like anybody was watching her. There was no remote monitoring even at that moment. And so I do have pharmacists that ask, um, and I understand that there can be fear and resistance to wanting to be in that mess because pharmacists are inherently used to knowing that if I know the search phrase, if I know what resource, Lexicomp, <laughs> up to date, wherever I go, I can find an answer. I know what this is, the decision matrix, and advocacy is very fluid. Hmm. You know, I never anticipated that at the beginning, of, uh, end of last week, beginning of this week, I can't remember when it happened, that I would now understand the North Carolina driving medical board review of whether we were a mandatory report and oh by the way that it's what is it the ntsb there's like a 600 page document federally that lists all the different states you know all the states in the union um and their requirements as to who has to be a mandatory report or not and what medical conditions require and impact driver's licenses because that was not on my radar <laughs> last week yeah. but it is now part of my life as an advocate right because it came up with a client need and so i think that that um, that inability to predict exactly what you're going to run into day out, day in and day out um, can result in some fear for some pharmacists. But more people are reaching out to me. More people are asking because it's also a way to build relationships to where, you know, the system at the moment doesn't present these encounters. Hmm. Andrea, this has been a really insightful conversation into the life of an advocate, but also just how you think about advocacy. Thanks for hanging out with me. It's been a lot of fun. It's been my pleasure, and it was great to get to talk to you. You know, I wasn't able to show all of that podcast because Andrea and I talked a little bit after, and we shared stories about what it was like to go through the healthcare system and to lose someone and and also her hopes and her dreams for what she sees um for advocacy and what she hopes to do and what she aims to do with people and it it was very very beautiful uh, a little bit too private so fortunately don't get to see that but what inspired me most about this conversation was that as much as I feel like some people think that the healthcare system is broken and it's not going to be fixed and it's not working, there is hope. There are good people in this system. There are people who care. And sometimes it's just meeting the right person that can make all the difference in the world for maybe your journey or someone else. Maybe you're interested in advocacy or maybe you just want to kind of move your career in that direction and you'd like to do something that you would actually be fulfilled. Well, my encouragement is to talk with us. We have lots of people on our team that are open to talking with you about your career, assessing where you're at, and maybe if it's advocacy or maybe it's something totally different and figuring out how to create a path to doing that. We're career coaches, and so we work to help you figure out where in the market you best fit, how to build a strategy to get those kinds of job and attract interviews and ultimately get a job offer for a company that you love. It's our life's work. It's what we love doing. And I would love to help you do that. Thanks for watching this episode. Let me know in the comments if you're watching on YouTube or somewhere else what you thought of this. We'd love to hear from you. And until we see you in the next one, take care.